Recently, Jay Dyer and Sam Shamoon debated some Muslims on the Fresh and Fit podcast. They did an excellent job. The Muslims, on the other hand, were entirely inconsistent in their reasoning. They used lots of fallacious arguments, and they even went for personal attacks. And I want to show some clips from that debate. But first, I want to talk about why I'm not a Muslim. And this debate was a great example of that. Because in the debate, we'll hear the Muslims claim that the Bible is corrupt. It actually doesn't say that anywhere in the Quran, that the Bible is corrupt. It says that people will twist the scriptures. It does not say that the Bible is corrupt anywhere in the Quran. Muslims are so inconsistent about the Bible being corrupt. They'll say, the Bible prophesizes Muhammad. But wait, I thought you just said it was corrupt. They just arbitrarily pick what parts of the Bible they're going to interpret in their Quranic Islamic lens and reinterpret the Bible. The Bible does not prophesize Muhammad. They'll say that the Bible doesn't teach a trinity that actually the Bible teaches Tawheed. They will claim that the Bible is corrupt, then cite the Bible. So which one is it? Is the Bible corrupt or not? I mean, I've got the Gospel of John pulled up right now. We can start going into the text. Let's start with John 1 about the Trinity. Eternal generation of the Son. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were through Him. Nothing was made that was not made by Him. Jesus is the creator of the world. There's nothing that exists that he didn't create. Therefore, the Son of God is not a creature. John 1, he was in the bosom of the Father even when he was on earth walking around. Eternal generation, omnipresence. After this, John said, I saw the Holy Spirit descending like a dove and remaining upon him. It is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. This is the Son of God, the Father. Right there in John 1, verses 32 to 34, the entire Trinity is revealed to you. And also in the Quran, it says that you can judge the Quran on the prior revelation. You know, Muslims think that the Torah and they say the Injil or gospel that Jesus was given book. But if we actually go to the prior revelation, the Torah and Bible, it makes Islam an impossibility and shows that Islam has no continuity with the prior revelation. And why would the Quran say to go to the prior revelation of the prior revelation is corrupt. It doesn't make any sense. The Quran, either way, it is refuting itself because the prior revelation contradicts the Quran. And if the Quran says that to go to the prior revelation, but the prior revelation is corrupt, it makes no sense. For example, in the worship that we read about in the Old Testament and we see how Christians worship, it was liturgical with a sacrifice, with the lamb, with the Eucharist. All, you know, these principles exist in Second Temple Judaism and Orthodox Christianity. It does not exist in Islam. It has no continuity. The worship, the entire theology of how God manifests himself, all these theophanies that I want to further explain later in the video. And so when you bring up to a Muslim that the Quran in Islam has no continuity with the Old Testament, it's completely arbitrary about the prior revelation being corrupt, they say, oh, the Quran is the perfect revelation from Allah. But it's, it's a circular argument. You're just referring to the Quran. You're not actually using the prior revelation. It is very important to understand that in the prior revelation, it is leading up to the Messiah. And the Islam believes in the Messiah, but they don't really understand what the Messiah is that Second Temple Judaism and Christianity understands. That the Messiah is going to be God incarnate and he's going to bring salvation to all people. A salvation to the Gentiles as it's promised in Genesis. The Messiah is Jesus Christ, and it's prophesied before in Zechariah 13 that there's not going to be any more prophets after the Messiah comes. This automatically cancels out anything like Mormonism or Islam that claims that it's new public divine revelation. In Zechariah, in Jude, it talks about how the faith was once for all delivered to the saints. Jesus, who Muslims claim was actually a Muslim, says that John the Baptist was the last prophet. There are no prophets. And also in 1 Galatians 8, it says that even if an angel comes from in heaven, if he preaches a different gospel, let him be accursed. And what do you know? That's exactly how the Quran was revealed to Muhammad from a quote unquote angel. So why would we trust this later revelation that contradicts the, the worship, the theology of the prior revelation? And we have specific warnings against it. There's no reason to trust the Quran that comes 600 years after the events of the Bible. Why would we trust that to say what actually happened? You're just a cheap knockoff. Oh no, I'm the upgrade. With Jesus. The Quran says that Jesus wasn't actually crucified. He was switched out at the last second. So why, why would you trust their version of God, Allah, who is deceiving everyone? Because that is essential, that is a corner piece of 
Christianity is Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And Islam takes that out and says he's just a prophet. Another huge fact that disproves Islam is that Jesus was not a Muslim. They'll quote verses like Jesus doing prostrations. Well, in Judaism and in Christianity, we still do prostrations. And he's prostrating towards God the Father. Allah is no father. So this whole entire theology of the Trinity of the Father, Allah is not a father. It doesn't make any sense. So how can you cite that verse? And I thought the Bible was corrupt. So it's just entirely inconsistent about how Muslims will cite the Bible. And all throughout the Bible, there's lots of verses that show that Jesus is all-knowing. Even in the Quran, it gives attributes to Jesus that only God, that only Allah can have because the Quran just took so much from Christianity and Judaism. That's that's what it ultimately did. So the doctrine of the Trinity is a doctrine that is not derived from philosophy. It's not derived from St. Paul primarily. It's not derived from the Council of Nicaea. The doctrine of the Trinity is taught in the law and the prophets. In fact, if you go back to my Daniel and Hikikachu debate, in the first 10 minutes, I hold up a whiteboard that shows all the passages from the Torah and then the prophets that we derive the doctrine of the Trinity from mainly from Jewish exegesis of the Old Testament. This might sound surprising because people think that the doctrine of Trinity is something that's unique to Christianity or that Jews <coughs> uh, don't believe in this nowadays, so therefore Jews could not have taught it back then. In fact, many Jewish scholars today, Benjamin Sommer, Alan Siegel, uh, Schaefer, etc., Boyarin, all of those so scholars admit that the early church's view <coughs> is not that distinct from the Judaism of the time of Christ in recognizing more than one person in the trinity i'm not saying that jews necessarily accept trinitarianism i'm saying that these scholars prove that in the time of christ there was not a generic unitarianism that characterized what it is to be quote monotheist they didn't see a contradiction or a problem between the idea of quote monotheism and the recognition of the father as the arche cause and fount the angel of the lord as his messenger which we see through all throughout the old testament who is called god who is called divine who is called the uh, messenger of the covenant who is called Yahweh in Exodus 3, Exodus 23, throughout the Psalms and the many uh, Theophanies passages, uh, and many times in the prophets, Jesus predicted, especially in latter Isaiah, to be a divine Messiah that would be worshipped. So a lot of these uh, references to the Trinity are primarily grounded, rooted in the Torah and the prophets. Islam, however, when it argues against the Trinity, does so on the basis of it not being aware of or not being informed typically on what the actual texts teach in terms of the Jewish texts that we as Christians also refer to. Also, when it comes to the text of the gospel, the, uh, the text of uh, the New Testament, they're not aware of the fact that Jesus throughout the gospel of John in every chapter refers to himself as both divine and or a member of the triad. John 1 talks about Jesus being the Logos. John 1 talks about him being eternally begotten. Monogenes Theos. So the eternal beginning, all of that is already at the beginning of the Gospel of John. And again, every chapter, whether it's John 5 through 9, where Jesus identifies himself as the one at Mount Sinai talking to Moses, the one that gave the law. Jesus refers to himself as the Son of God many times over, which means that his God is not Allah because Allah has no sons. So Jesus many, many times over throughout the Gospel says he is the Son of God and that he makes us by grace sons of God. This proves that there is not the same God of Muhammad and the same God of uh, of Jesus. Jesus is not referring to Allah as his father. Allah has no sons. Uh, so when we come to the time of the early church fathers, they unanimously teach the deity of Christ, the uh, triad as well, the deity of the Holy Spirit. This becomes codified by the time of Nicaea. It's not invented at the time of Nicaea. You can read the church fathers from Irenaeus to Ignatius to Clement. You can read Cyril, uh, Cyp excuse me, Cyprian. You can read Athanasius. All these church fathers, Alexander writing prior to the time of Nicaea that teach the deity of Christ and what would become the doctrine or known as the doctrine of the Trinity. So the Trinity is not something foreign to the scriptures. It's rooted in the Torah. It's rooted in the prophets, it's rooted in the New Testament, rooted in the teaching of Christ himself. And uh, I would add that when we compare it to what's in the Quran, the Quran makes many mistakes, first of all, about what the Christians teach. They, they say that we take our monks as lords. We do not. They, take, they, they think that the Quran thinks that we take Mary as part of the Trinity. We do not. Uh, the Quran also is itself confused in two areas that I always like to highlight, which is that it claims that prior revelation confirms it and backs it up. And many times over, like in uh, Surah 5, it says that you can look to the previous revelation to confirm the new revelation. But the old revelation contradicts it. And when Muslims see the contradictions, they do the same move of Ijaz in the debate to say, uh, well, we reject all the times that it contradicts, but we accept all the time that it is with our revelation. Well, that is a circle. That's 
arguing for the thing that's in question. We want to know how does the prior revelation confirm the new revelation, which the Quran says it can do, if the prior revelations are corrupt and how a foolish it would be to look to a corrupt book to supposedly prove an incorrupt book. So it makes no sense on the face of it. Uh, I would also then argue that the doctrine of Tanzi that's uh, derived from the passages that talk about Allah being nothing like creation 42 and I think around uh, 110 somewhere in there. It says that Allah is absolutely nothing like creation and yet Muslims many times over will utilize terminology, language and so forth to liken Allah to a created thing. To say that Allah is merciful, that he is just, he has all these things. Uh, Allah has a hand, has a shin and so forth. Things that come up in uh, the uh, accepted uh, hadiths. Well, all of those things are contradictory to the notion of Tawheed, that God is a pure unity or pure oneness. This is why Muslims for centuries have debated amongst themselves whether the attributes are really distinct. And you have people like Jake, Salafis, and others who say, no, yes, uh, Allah has a foot, has a shin. We don't know the modality, but he really has these things, the real attributes. And yet, we're said to be only a, a religion of perfect unity and perfect oneness, yet he's many. Well, the same problem that you have with the attributes and the dependence relationship of the attributes on Allah's essence and amongst themselves is no different than the question that we have about the persons of the Trinity. It's just simply that you say that we have a problem that you don't have to answer when you have the exact same problem in relationship to the attributes and Allah's essence and their dependence relationship. And if you don't think there's a dependence relationship, then I will just simply say, do you believe that they are then uh, ase or self-existent? If they're self-existent, then you have, uh, what, 99 gods. So you have the same problem, but a double standard into how, as to how you answer that. I'm not saying, note, that you believe that the attributes of persons. I know you don't believe that. But the same problem of the one and the many and the dependence status between the attributes and the essence is a problem that you cannot answer because within Islam, there are countless multiple contradictions. Many Christians are lured into Islam without actually understanding it. For example, they may say the Trinity is too hard to understand, you know, one God and three persons. Uh, I can't believe in the Trinity, it's too hard. But when you actually look at Islamic theology, their version of God, that Allah has two hands, he has a shin, and they believe these are real, unless you're subverting the Quran. Quran says that Allah has one eye. Read Surah Qalam, Surah number 68, ayah number 42. The shin of Allah is mentioned. <laughs> described in the Quran that he has a face. Allah described in the Quran that he has two hands. And both of Allah's hands are right hands. We believe that both of the hands of Allah are what? Huh? The hadith says very clearly that both his hands are right. The saqi refers to Allah's shin. It isn't simpler. It's, they haven't actually read the Quran. It's just people having a romanticized version of Islam. That's just so. It's just so simple, and it's just so unified. No, it isn't. There's lots of diversity of thought within Islam, and a lot of what we see online is a very new, modern kind of rest restorationist sect of Salafism. Many people also don't know about Islam. That music is haram. That dogs are haram. That an angel won't enter your house if you have a dog. But the number one reason why people leave Islam is seeing the gross immorality of the Prophet Muhammad. In Christianity, we see progressive revelation with Jesus, the God-man, the perfect person. He's fully God, fully man. He lived a morally perfect life. He was sinless. Versus in Islam, it's a downgrade after with Muhammad is he has sexual relations with a six-year-old, Aisha. And this is the number one reason that people leave is learning about this, their greatest prophet does this. Also when they learn that the Quran has many historical and scientific errors, that it was not perfectly preserved, they think that Muhammad had it revealed in, but he was illiterate and that's part of the miracle. They can't answer the, is a Quran created or uncreated? If you have something uncreated that's not Allah, how do they account for that on their theology? The point is, is that a lot of people are intrigued by Islam, but they haven't actually studied it in depth. There are so many problems that we could get into. One last one I want to mention is Islam's iconoclasm, being against religious icons and veneration. And we see this in the Sunnis versus Shias. The Shias are, are more okay with, you know, some level of, of veneration and tradition versus the Sunnis are very, they're like the Calvinist of, of Islam. They just want to get rid of it all, especially a lot of the modern Sunnis that we see, even though veneration happens at the Kaaba. So why are they allowing idolatry? There's all these contradictions. 
God interact with his people. He interacted in theophanies, in a direct manifestations of God, where he is tangible and often visible to humans. But how can we make sense of this? Just based off the Old Testament, we can see from the very beginning that God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. We can read in Genesis that the Lord appeared to Abraham. How does the Lord appear to Abraham? How does Jacob wrestle with God in Genesis? Jacob not only wrestles with God, but he also says, I have seen God face to face. When Moses goes to the burning bush, God calls out of it. God himself is in the burning bush. How do we make sense of this? How do we make sense of Moses talking face to face with God? in Exodus. All throughout the Old Testament, there are these theophanies. There are these things that we read about in Isaiah when God is referring to himself in plural and manifesting himself. The Spirit of God, the Word, His breath, His glory. We read about all these scenarios where God interacts with His people in a very unique way, and I will cover these in depth later in the video. One of the most interesting things in the Old Testament is the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord is not only an angel who appears continually throughout the Old Testament, referring to himself as Lord, as God in the first person and not in the second person. Every other angel refers to themselves as a third person. But who is this angel of the Lord? From the very beginning, in Genesis, the angel angel of the Lord refers to himself as God in the first person. All these examples in Exodus, Numbers, Judges, Zechariah of the angel of the Lord talking in the first person that this is God, that this is a manifestation of God. This is no accident. This is exactly why concepts like this were debated in ancient Judaism and are still debated to this day in rabbinical Judaism of who is the angel of the Lord. Even before Christ became incarnate, there was talk of the angel of the Lord about God's word, the logos. The Spirit, God's wisdom, God's glory, they struggled to make sense of this. And so when Christ becomes incarnate, the early church fathers picked up on this. They weren't inventing anything new. That's who this is all along. It's Christ. No longer do we have to wonder of how to make sense of these Old Testament theophanies, of how Jacob wrestled with God, of how Moses saw God face to face. It's just in their mind that the full revelation was given. That gets us into this debate that Sam and Jay recently did. I think they're some of the best Christian apologists against Islam. I mean, the Bible affirms that the prophet Muhammad is a true prophet in 1 John chapter well, the same 4, Bible verse that 2 and 3. Hasn't been I'm reading it, yes. Yeah, it's, it's false and it's fake, but it says some things are occasionally right. A broken <laughs> clock can be right one occasionally. Okay, right? False and it's and fake, but it's good here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you just heard it. Good job. Fake. Good job, Dan. I don't deny it. <laughs> we never say we never made the claim that it's all of false and fake. I'll prove it here. Praise be the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the one true God, and glory to the Son of God who became flesh for our salvation. May the Lord Jesus be magnified and the falsehood of Tawheed exposed. Notice what Daniel did. Instead of focusing on what it means for Allah to be one, he spent the bulk of his time criticizing the Trinity, but we will answer his objections in a rebuttal period, but I'm now going to turn against him because not so fast. When he says he believes in Tawheed, what exactly does it mean for Allah to be one? Because I'm aware that Daniel does believe the fact that the Quran is uncreated. And therefore, we now have two distinct eternal entities that are not identical. Because I'm going to show Daniel from his authentic sources that the Quran and the chapters of the Quran actually want to see and debate with Allah. So now we have a paradox. Because if the Quran is the speech of Allah, and that's Allah speaking, is Allah speaking to himself? So is Daniel actually a modalist? Or is he a polytheist? Or does he have a form of a trinity? But his is even worse, because it's not three persons, because each chapter of the Quran has a potentiality of speaking with Allah. So that means his God consists of at least 115 divine persons or divine beings who can interact with one another and appear separately. And this is all from his authentic narrations. Secondly, the second problem he has is that according to the Quran, the spirit of Allah is not Gabriel. So I'm going to now press him. There's not a single verse in the Quran that says the spirit, the Ruh, is Jibreel. He's now dependent on the very scholars of Islam that come centuries later to bail out Allah and his messenger, because that's what he accused <laughs> the Lord Jesus, that Jesus wasn't clear enough to articulate the Trinity, but he did make an admission, which is now going to come and bite him. He admitted Paul taught the Trinity. It's now recorded. I want everyone to hear it. Paul taught the Trinity, because when we come to the scriptures, I'm going to show that even the Quran acknowledges that Paul was used by Allah to spread the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The spirit, according to the Quran, is distinct from Allah. He appears as a man. He speaks and creates. So now if we add the spirit to the Quran and Allah, He's got about 116 divine persons or beings. Then we can go a little further and adjust the issue of the fact that according to our friend here, 
Allah has, well, he wouldn't use the term body parts. I don't want to misrepresent him. Allah has a foot. He has a shin. He even has loins. And he has at least two eyes, if not more, and two right hands. Now, for the life of me, if Allah is the creator of the heavens and the earth, how does he exist as an embodied being without him dwelling in space? Because if he's atemporal, he's timeless. That means his God supposedly exists when there was no time, space, and place. But if you have a foot, and you have a shin, and you have two right hands. I don't know what happened to the left one, but we'll get into that. Two right hands, at least two eyes. In fact, the Arabic says three or more, but we'll get into that. Then that means his God is an embodied, embodied being who is temporal and finite, which means that his God did not create all space or place and time because there's a space that his body parts need to occupy in order for him to be his God. So the problem is actually worse for Daniel than for us. So he's going to have to explain how is it that he's a polytheist, pagan, masquerading, as a monotheist. Yeah, I'd like to point out that uh, in uh, Daniel's opening statement, he also committed a fallacy, which is a form of uh, Occam's razor fallacy. He kept appealing to the fact that because it's simple, then it must be obvious it must be the case. Just because something seems or appears to be simpler or more obvious or because it was only four short and simple sentences has nothing to do with whether it's true or false. In fact, as we're going to see, the Muslims amongst themselves and their various schools all compete and disagree and fight, not only over the attributes, but also over jurisprudence. Daniel, I want to hear from your own mouth, the Yad of Allah. Is it a metaphor for his power? It can be a metaphor for his power. It can be uh, interpreted in many different ways. It does not contradict, it does not contradict Tawheed. It does not contradict monotheism. Yes, it does. You can have an Ashari position and interpret it as a metaphor, or you can have a Salafi Athari position and interpret it differently. What is your position? What's, okay. What yeah, do you I've studied Salafi, Athari Islam, no, I've studied you? Ashari no, Islam. No, you, you've studied it, but you won't say your position. Yeah. What are you? What I have do you studied believe? all of them. It's irrelevant oh, to this great, debate. That, stick, so to so <laughs> okay. stick to the topic. Stick to the topic. Stick to the topic. Stick to the topic. What topic is explained to me? So, moderator, moderator, he doesn't let me answer the question. He doesn't let me answer the question. No, because you're not. You're you're doing a dodgeball. Your Quran. All right, I'm going to add 30 seconds to the clock. created, right, Daniel? Yes. Okay, so the hadith that I cited, when it says Surah Al-Baqarah, Surah Al-Ran, will appear as flocks of birds interceding for those that recited them. Do you take that metaphorically or do you take it actually? This is a personification of the Quran, just like the Bible verses that I mentioned about rivers clapping their hands, uh, their stones Where does it speaking. Say that? In the Psalms, I'll read them again. In no, Luke, not the Psalm. Hadith. Yeah, Where so does it say it's a you're making the claim that if the Quran is personified, that means it has a separate mind. So and I put the point to you. And I, see, now you're interrupting. No, because so, I want to can I answer? Can I answer the question? Good. Good. So I pointed out that just because there's personification, that doesn't imply that there's a separate mind. And I cited verses of the oh, Bible. Your common. response. Your response was that, no, this is just personification in the Bible. So personification is okay in the Bible. That doesn't imply that Papa the Bible, Jackie's that stones have minds and that rivers have minds. That's, person, that's fine. Okay, but if the Quran does it, your, or if uh, Hadith promise. do it, see, you know, it's your, my position, your position is he that you call them parts. You, you can add, I you call address them your parts. position or are you going to rant and rave because you want to eat up time? <laughs> Stop attacking straw man. In the Psalm, you will not find where it says, and the moon will come and intercede for those that look to it and venerated it. The hadiths I cited is about the day of resurrection. It's about intercession. So I want to know, what do you mean by personification when in those hadiths, it's talking about the surahs interceding with Allah, will there be intercession? Is that true? <clears throat> will people need intercession before Allah? Is that true? So what exactly do you mean by personification? Because your appeal to the Psalms shows that you don't understand what a personification is. A simple question. Okay. Why did the scribes omit uh, uh, for the, in the Vulgate that Jesus does know the day or the hour when it addresses him as the son speaking of the person, not speaking of natures? You said about scribes changing the text, so that is referring to the veracity of the scriptures. But even if we go with your very imbalanced approach to textual criticism, they must have done a very poor job because they left intact the Father alone. So even your argument buries you because whatever the scribes did, if they inserted the word son or omitted it, because there's a debate among textual critics, that passage still has the Father alone. So they must have done a very poor job because they didn't remove the word alone, and they left Mark 13, 32 intact, because I know what you're referring to, Matthew 24, 36. Yeah, by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, Muhammad's God and judge. I'm now going to show the Muslims the dilemma they're in, because I'm not debating a Bart Ehrman. 
who doesn't care about Muhammad. I'm debating Muslims who are supposedly take the position of Muhammad. So I'm appealing to Muhammad because they believe in him. I pray they repent and turn away from him because he's under the feet of Jesus Christ. But coming to that point, anytime Ijaz attacks the Bible, he shows that he's smarter than Muhammad, better than Muhammad, knows more than Muhammad. Why? Because the consistent teaching of the Quran and the sound narrations, we're going to get into this, is that Muhammad confirmed the very scriptures that the Jews and Christians had in their possession at his time. And the Quran says that Jesus confirmed the very scriptures between his hands at his time. Unless now he just wants to come up with some new set of scriptures, the only scriptures that would have been in existence in the time of Jesus up to Muhammad are the very scriptures that have variations, just like the Quran does. Let me just go through a slew of verses for the sake of time. Chapter 2, verses 40 to 44. Chapter 2, verse 89. Chapter 2, verse 91. Chapter 2, verse 101. Chapter 2, verse 113. Chapter 2, verse 121. Chapter 2, verse 136. Chapter 3, verses 3 to 4. Chapter 3, verse 50. Chapter 4, verse 47. And then we go to chapter 5, and we read verses 43 to 48, 66 to 68, and on and on it goes. And then the sound narration. So, Ejaz, make my day. Attack the Bible for variations, because you show that you know more than Muhammad. That means you expose him as a false prophet. But if you believe in Muhammad, you have to accept the Bible, and he's still a false prophet, because Muhammad was an ummi. He did not know that his Quran contradicts the Bible. Now, the same arguments that they're going to level against Scripture, I will use to bury their belief in Scripture, because Ijaz is going to have to come clean and talk about the Ahruf. What are they exactly? What are the seven Ahruf? Over 35 opinions given by scholars, and we know it cannot be dialectal, because I'm going to show from a hadith in Bukhari that Umar heard Hisham recite chapter 25 of the Quran so differently, he dragged him to Muhammad, and Muhammad said, yes, I taught it to him this way, and Umar recited, I taught the chapter to you this way, but they were both Quraysh and spoke the same dialect, so it cannot be dialectal differences. And then we're going to add to the problem the missing verses and surahs found in the codices of Abdullah ibn Masud, Ubay bin Kaab, two of the four men that Muhammad said learn the Quran from. He didn't say Zayd ibn Tabit. He said, learn the Quran from Abdullah ibn Masud, Ubay bin Kaab, and yet they contradicted each other and your Uthmanic codex, Musaf, because there are missing verses and missing surahs. So much for the perfectly preserved Quran. But then add to insult injury. Your Uthman decided to burn copies of the Quran that were in conflict to the point that Muslims are about to come to blows. You don't come to blows over minor differences. And he had the Quran's burn, and yet Abdullah bin Masood refused to the point that your sources say that Uthman instigated a mob reaction against Abdullah bin Masood who got beat and his bones broken because he thought his knowledge of the Quran was superior to your Zayd ibn Thabit who was an Ansari. Then we add insult to injury. What do you do with the different Qirat? According to your Muslim sources, there were 25 Qirat. By the time Ibn 30. Mujahid came, centuries later, 300 years later, after the death of your prophet, he's the one who standardized seven. By whose authority? So my challenge to you is, show me anywhere in your Quran or your authentic tradition where your God sanctioned all these Qirat and authorized Ibn Mujahid to standardize seven qirat, and these qirat are not identical. And then I want you to explain to me what the ahruf are, and then we're going to go into the missing verses, and we're going to go into the missing. That's time. Sir, the, uh, ver the, the text that Sam listed presupposed that you could go and confirm the new revelation with the old. So if I were to set up a hypothetical scenario of a 6th, 7th century Jew or Christian hearing this message, hearing it for the first time, it's being revealed, 7th century, I should say. And we're told that we can go check it against the prior revelation. If the prior revelation is corrupt, how foolish then that we're checking it against something corrupted. And in fact, the texts actually don't say that the prior revelation is corrupted. That's a made up thing that he's uh, attacking on uh, later on. Can you either of you explain to me how many Western scholars of the Bible believe that the uh, Old Testament can be traced back to Moses versus how many believe that the Quran can be traced to the life of the Prophet Muhammad? I have one better for you than Western scholars. I have your prophet. So if Western scholars are right, then join me in saying Muhammad is an antichrist, a false prophet. I appeal to your prophet, you appeal to Western scholars. And it depends on which Western scholars you want to appeal to, because not all Western scholars believe the same thing and hold the same presuppositions. But I can also appeal to Western scholars that don't think that your Quran, as you have it, is even from Uthman, it's actually from Abdul Malik from the 8th century. But I did you better. I went to Muhammad. Why do you have a problem with Muhammad? Why are you ashamed of Muhammad? He's your prophet, right? Your prophet tells me that the scriptures that Jesus had 
that Torah is the uncorrupt revelation of God, perfectly preserved, and Jesus confirmed it. And since you believe the Torah was given to Moses, your prophet did it for me. So if you give me 99% of what's in scholarship, then either your prophet is wrong, and admit he is, and I agree he is, but for other reasons, right? Or the scholars are wrong. You can't have your cake and eat it too. Why do you keep doing jihad against your prophet? Yeah, you'll find other uh, prophets in the Bible talking about ritual purity. Um, we acknowledge that these religions were originally from God. So you do find ritual uh, purity in the Bible or in Christianity, um, but that doesn't mean that Islam copied these traditions. Um, the source is the same. It's coming from the same God. If it's from the same God, then it's continuity. No, there is, no, no. There's How is that continuity? continuity? How is that continuity? It's from the same God. You just said that. Yeah, it's the same source. Where did I say continuity? Well, if the if the rituals came to the, our religion from the same God to yours, that's continuity. We talked about punishment for blasphemy, punishment for adultery, execution. Do you condemn that, or do you think that that's that the morality? You might think that it's not applicable today. Fine, but Jesus is still commanding that for that time, for a previous time. So, do you think that is morally justified? All right, that's yeah. Sam. Go ahead, Sam. No, let me answer. Yeah. Now, if you read these laws in the context from which you're quoting, unlike your prophet who didn't give any sign that his God was backing him up, why don't you read these statements in context? In the context, your Allah, who you admit is Jesus, because according to the Quran, that was Allah, which you just admit is Jesus. So Jesus is Muhammad's Allah, his God. In the context of those passages, God appears to the nation visibly in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night not only in front of the Israelites, but he also appears to the Egyptians, leaving them with no excuse to defy his commands. In other words, unlike your Elah, the God of the Bible proved his existence. The God of the Bible set up a theocracy on earth. The God of the Bible gave them ample proof not to doubt his existence so that when they see him in the pillar of cloud, pillar of fire by night, hear his voice audibly and see the signs so that even the Egyptians saw the pillar of cloud, Exodus 14, 19 to 31, as well as Joshua 2, 8 to 11. He gave the nations no excuse for defying him. So when God shows up, then he has every right to tell you how to live. And if you defy him, he has every right to take away your life because he's the God over death and life. This is unlike your prophet who could not provide any proof that God was speaking through him, who could not provide that his God even exists. All he did was he borrowed the collateral of the Jews and Christians, claimed to be a prophet like the prophets found in the Jewish Christian tradition. But when he's challenged to prove that God sent him, failed miserably. So you're comparing apples and pineapples. So if God shows up and I see and I know that he exists, he has every right to tell me what to do and every right to inflict any punishment he deems fit. Unlike your Elah who doesn't exist. You'll notice that when I brought up the line of argumentation that Daniel had in our debate, he didn't want to go there. He immediately said that I was uh, that he was living rent free in my head. In other words, deflecting away from the fact that I've called him out on an inconsistency, because in that debate, he was arguing for Islam having more continuity with the laws of the Old Testament. That doesn't suit his purpose here. And so he doesn't want to go to that. And he has to deflect away. Oh, I live in your head rent free. Uh, no, that's because I just caught you in a double standard. You're using two different standards as usual. He's ignorant of Mosaic law because the Jews who lived after the time of Sinai, they were still bound by the Old Testament law. They were still bound by the Mosaic law. They were still <laughs> killing the blasphemers, uh, executing anyone who uh, tempted you to worship idols. You have to execute them. That's what Jesus says. Those uh, Jews didn't see pillars of clouds. <laughs> they didn't see any miracles. They were living after the time of Sinai. So your biblical in, uh, Alec, or your exegesis is completely off base. Uh, Daniel, for ten to listen here. better. I know you're going to embarrass yourself. You just destroyed your prophet again. Because if you read the Old Testament, God didn't stop at Sinai. And you're accusing me of not reading the Bible. I think you want to be an Umi like your prophet. Continue reading the rest of the Old Testament. God kept sending prophets with miracles and signs to keep ratifying and confirming his existence and that this is his law and he has a right to put to death whoever he wants because in first kings 18 elijah had a shout down with your spiritual ancestors because your god allah of the quran is baal and their god showed up miraculously that your god is fake and yahweh is true so no i am consistent with the old testament narrative all throughout god shows up 
miraculously through prophets to confirm, I am God, this is my covenant, I have a right to do with you as I see fit. Nothing for your prophet, the prophet of Baal, because your God is a fake God, and the God revealed in Jesus is the true God. End of story. Bye-bye. You but lost. I mean, the Bible affirms that the prophet Muhammad is a true prophet in First John chapter well, the same 4, Bible that hasn't been preserved. I'm reading it. Yes. It's false and it's fake, but it says some things are occasionally right. A broken <laughs> clock can be right. right. A broken, a broken <laughs> clock can be right twice a day. Not a game, false and fake, but that's good here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you just heard good, good, good job, guys. Good job, I man. don't You're deny this. We <laughs> But we wanted to be courteous and not bring this stuff up. But when Sam gets down and dirty and starts insulting the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, then we have to respond in kind. We have to insult Sam and point out his uh, vile history and the kinds of filth that he puts on his channel. So we're just playing fair. You wanted to go down and dirty yeah, and use funny. filthy language. Then we're going to bring up the fact that a plumber basically stole your wife <laughs> and right. you and you had uh, certain charges against you. That's all. That's all. Yeah, now, I condemn child now, as far as those accusations, let's assume those accusations are true. All you're proving is that I'm a sinner, unfaithful to the teachings of Christ. But I was acting like Muhammad because Muhammad did a lot of plumbing with a lot of women other than his own wives, because when he sanctioned women and selling them off as chattel that's condemned by the god of moses in deuteronomy 21 10 to 14 so lord forgive me for acting like muhammad because i know acting like muhammad leads me to hell so may have mercy and as far as violence well it's your quran that says that you guys can beat your wives so if you want to accuse me of that more power to you so scholars do not say it traces back to the very words of jesus they actually say it, it goes back to the ideas about what jesus could have said it's called the ipsism of vox so what jesus could have said there is no way to determine that jesus actually said anything that is claimed in the new testament when he talks about ipsism of vox ipsism of verba that now he just destroyed the quran even worse because when we come to the case of the gospels no christian denies that human authors were used to communicate the words of jesus in translation in greek and god can do that so they're not going to quote exactly Exactly the same way in a target language but what he doesn't tell you and i did series on this allah who's supposedly speaking the quran will repeat the same story with the same speech whether moses and the egyptians or shaitan iblis and allah or lot and he cannot get the details in the exact same way he'll quote the same speeches and often various conflicting contradictory reporting so the quran itself is one huge ipsissima vox which is surprising because i thought allah speaking and allah knows everything and recalls speeches perfectly so much for Allah and him being all-knowing and then if we extend that to the hadith your own scholars admit that when it comes to even your authentic traditions you have ipsissima vox of your prophet not ipsissima verba moreover if the Bible is not preserved you prove Muhammad is an antichrist because he confirmed all the scriptures he didn't make any fuss about the variant readings because if he did he would end up bearing your Quran because he admit that the Quran did not come down in one mode ahruf which your scholars till this day don't even know what the that means. That's why you have over 35 opinions about what the Ahruf are, which means if you're consistent, you just destroyed the Quran, you destroyed your prophet, you destroyed your God. Stop being a Muslim. There's a debate. There's not no clarity in the Christian tradition because it's a contradiction. That's why. But we don't have the same problem in Islam. The Quran doesn't have a mind. So how does it contradict monotheism? No Can one I could explain that. No one could Can explain that. that. No uh, one could explain yeah, that ahead, in Jay, this please, debate. Please go ahead and. Uh, no, because there's a debate, it's not clear. Would that mean that because there's a debate in Islam amongst all the schools, none of it's clear about the attributes? No one debates about uh, Islam oh, having. They don't debate the attributes? multiple gods having. They don't debate the attributes. Minds that i have multiple uh, attributes that doesn't mean i'm multiple no, people debates, like how is how is that you don't debate, you're telling me you don't debate how does that contradict you don't debate Tawhid. Daniel, explain you don't explain. debate Tawhid. you know you debate Tawhid. there are i'm not saying that there are debates that there are no debates in islam there well, are debates in islamic debate theology exactly yeah. so that was a bad argument no no but there's debate in christianity yeah. about the nature right. of god there isn't that same debate about there's being three yes, and one. Yes, what is. is the difference between yes, the father and the Jake son? Do they have Jake the same knowledge? Bo Do they have the Jake same will? Do they have the same knowledge? Do they have the same will? We don't have Jake the same debate. Bo Branson. <laughs> we don't have that same debate in it, Islam. It doesn't that was matter the point. The same debate. You, you have debate means it's you, not clear. No, you said no. if there's debate, it's not clear. That's a fallacy. You're a fallacy machine. Okay, mean, that's uh, fine. First of all, the Quran says that the um torah and the injil the scripture of the past has been distorted they change it with their hands uh point number two is that um he doesn't understand the difference between am versus khas in arabic am means general general statement versus khas a specific statement so if i 
point to a book and I say, this is a reliable book or this book confirms what I'm saying, I don't necessarily mean that there every single line of that book I agree with or every single line of that book is true. I'm making, not, making an I'm statement, a general statement that the book is true. Sam can only have an uncharitable reading or an uncharitable interpretation of the Prophet's words in that hadith if we assume that that hadith is authentic. So there is a difference of opinion on the authenticity of that hadith, and he knows it. Chapter 2, verses 70, 79 shows again what you've been doing to the Bible, you're doing to your own Quran, and you fall under the condemnation of 378. You not only have the audacity to twist the scriptures, you have the audacity to twist the Quran. Anyone, I'm challenging here, let, let's do a debate on 275, 79, your proof text. Mano Iman. Let's debate it. Go read the context. I've done an extensive study and the Muslim commentators. It's talking about a particular group identified as Jews who wrote the book with their own hands. It doesn't say all Jews everywhere, let alone mention the Christians. You just butchered the Quran like you've been butchering the Bible, but I come back to butcher you. That's number one. Number two, you said that the Hadith where Muhammad confirmed the Torah, that there are differences of opinion. Well, you probably didn't hear my recent responses to your friend, Jake. Ibn Qayyim al Josia, which I have quoted, and and if you want to read Arabic, because you think you boast about reading Arabic, I'll let you read the Arabic and parse it. Ibn Qayyim al Josia said, A group of scholars believe the Torah is uncorrupt. One of the evidences they gave is the hadith of Abu Dawood. They quoted it. They didn't question its authenticity. And even Al-Albani said it's Hassan. But put Albani aside. Ibn Qayyim al josia for those of you who don't know, he's the disciple of Sheikh al-Islam, Ibn Taymiyyah, his granddaddy, when it comes to Salafi anthropomorphism. And he says, these scholars quoted this hadith. I guess they didn't know about the science of hadith classification. Thank God Allah sent you to correct them. Because they said that when Muhammad saw their Torah, he put it on the cushion. He goes, I believe in you and him who revealed you. And then the scholars say he would not have said it if he thought the Torah. Torah was corrupted. And among the people that Ibn Qayyim al Josia lists as saying the Torah and the Gospel are incorruptible are Al Bukhari and Razi, which you probably don't care much about Razi, but Imam Al Bukhari, the one who collected the most seconds. authentic narrations according to you, the Hadith. Now, the final thing is if variant readings invalidate the Bible, it buries your Quran because you have thousands of variant readings, but then you explain the way as Qirat. But who authorized the Qirat? Show me one verse from your Allah that said that Mujahid would come and standardize seven readings of the Quran. You make it up as you go along. The gig is up. Game over for your religion. Now, to be fair, Muhammad, peace be upon him, also commands war in some contexts. But the difference is Muhammad, peace be upon him, doesn't command Muslims to kill women, children, and babies. I want to thank Daniel for proving that Jesus is his God, Allah. Because according to the Quran, in chapter 5, verse 20 to 26, it was his Allah that ordered Moses and the Israelites to enter Canaan and wipe it out. Also, it was his Allah that ordered Saul, which the Quran erroneously calls Talud, in chapter 2, verse 246 to 251, where it was his Allah, whom he said was Jesus. So you just admit Jesus is Allah, Muhammad's God and judge. In chapter 2, verse 246 to 251, who ordered Saul on these expeditions. And there's not a word of condemnation by his prophet saying that what Saul did to the livestock and children was an abomination to Allah. That means he's better than his God and his prophet. And again, I want to thank Daniel for proving that Jesus is Allah, his God, because in Sahil Bukhari, volume 4, number 353. Ask me to read it because I don't want to eat up my time. There, in an authentic narration, his prophet refers to a prophet who went in an expedition jihad, and the sun stood still, and his prophet narrates the injunctions of Deuteronomy chapter 20, and also alludes to Joshua chapter 7 and 10. So that means Jesus is Allah, his God, Muhammad's judge, because according to your prophet, your God sanctioned these wars. So that means you're better than your... Before time began... There was the cube. We know not where it comes from, only that it holds the power to create worlds. Thank you so much for watching. God bless.